Yeah, hey, folks, we'll uh, make a start. So, uh, following on from last lesson's work where we looked at uh, the reactions of acids with metals, uh, just a little start so to see if you can remember any uh, of that learning. So, we've got different acids here, we've got different metals. Can you predict what the products will be called? All right, so just write down what the products will be called. Um, and then two extra questions. Most of the salts produced are soluble, uh, so they're dissolved in a solution. How would you get the solid salt crystals back? And then the final question, how can I test to see what the other product is? So there's a hint there. You're not just going to get one product in each case. You're going to get two. So I'm going to give you three or four minutes just to have a go at that. If you're watching this video later, then just, you know, uh, skip the table out and fill it in. So it's having a predicting what the products would be formed. The salts produced by these metals were with these acids. Do you remember what the suffix will be or the surname of the salt will be? That's based on the acid. So if I use sulfuric acid, what type of salts will be produced? Nitrates, phosphates, you tell me. Okay, so let's have a go at these answers. Right, so quick reminder of how you actually name the salts that produce. The first name of each salt comes from the metal. So palladium metal will produce palladium, oops, palladium salts. And then the surname or comes, or the second name comes from the acid used. So it's sulfuric acid used, so it would be palladium sulfate. And as I asked, said earlier, What's the other product going to be? Because when an acid reacts with a metal, you get a salt plus a particular type of gas. Hopefully that helped you. Hydrogen, yep. So all of these will produce hydrogen. Okay. So the next one then, naming the salt, it's hydrochloric acid. So again, loads of people might say something like hydrochloride or hydrochlorate. Right. You need to remember that hydrochloric acid forms chloride salts. So this will be titanium chloride, and then again, plus hydrogen. And the next one, you're getting the idea now. Potassium reacts to form potassium salts. Is it potassium sulfate, nitrate, phosphate, citrate, all these wonderful different salts that are produced. And because it's nitric acid, you get potassium nitrate plus hydrogen. This one, we didn't actually look at citric acid, but hopefully you can get an idea based on how nitric acid is called nitrates. Citric acid forms citrates. So 
So that'll be zinc citrate plus hydrogen. And the last one, phosphoric acid plus barium will produce barium phosphate. And again, plus hydrogen. So again, you need to be able to do uh, predict the product's forms. You also need to be able to answer the following two questions and also write similar equations of which we'll have a bit more practice on as we go through the topic. So most of the salts produced, so that's these things here, are soluble and they're dissolved in the solution. How would you get the solid salt back? So hopefully you get the idea that if you've got a solution like salt water, for example, uh, how do I get the salt, the solid, out of the water? We're simply just evaporate or boil off all of the water. Uh, I'm going to use to a fancy terminology now. We call that process crystallization. So it's not exactly evaporation, it's something called crystallization, whereby you effectively evaporate the water until you see the first piece of solid form. And then what you do is you leave the rest of it to evaporate uh, over time. So it could take 24 hours, it could take a week, but you end up getting some really nice crystals as a result. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you later on. And then how can I test to see what the other product is? Well, you can see the other product is hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. So what is the test for hydrogen? Uh, I demonstrated this in last week's lesson, on Thursday's lesson. So what happened? What did I put into the test tube? A lit splint goes pop. It makes a little popping sound. That's a test for hydrogen because hydrogen is a very uh, flammable gas, actually explosive gas. So I'm going to treat it with respect. Okay. So that's a little uh, starter just to sort of summarize things that we looked at last lesson. Right, so today, quick recap. We know that when an acid and a base react, a base is just a generic term for anything that reacts with an acid. Uh, we looked at metals last week, metals being a form of base. Acid plus metal makes a salt plus hydrogen. Well, today we're going to be looking at this one. So an acid plus a metal oxide doesn't make hydrogen this time, it makes water. So the only difference you can see, acid plus, so last week it was acid plus metal makes salt plus hydrogen. Well this time it's acid plus metal oxide makes a salt plus water. And hopefully if you know uh, the chemical formula for water, that makes a bit more sense. So last week, we know that it formed hydrogen, which is H2, yeah? When all we did was react an acid with a metal. Well, this week, we're not reacting it with a metal, we're reacting it with a metal oxide. So we've actually got a bit of oxygen in our base. So that means that our product that's formed won't just be hydrogen, it'll be hydrogen with a bit of oxygen. And what do we know that's got hydrogen and a bit of oxygen in it? H2O. So again, most of the bases, in fact, all the bases bar metals that we come across form water as the byproduct. So acid plus metal oxide makes a salt plus water. Acid plus metal makes a salt plus hydrogen. That is the key difference. So when you do that, there's an example of one here. So I've got hydrochloric acid plus calcium oxide makes calcium chloride and water. And let's look at that equation in a bit more detail. Because we've got our acid, look at the state symbols. All acids have a state symbol of AQ, which means aqueous, which means it's dissolved in water. And we're adding a bit of solid to it. And we're forming another solution and liquid water. So this is a pretty dull reaction, as in there's not gonna be any fizzing, there's not gonna be any explosions, anything like that. Um, we're gonna effectively a solid is gonna be there at the start and there at the end. This is a classic exam question. What will you observe during a chemical reaction? Even if it's a reaction you've not seen before, use the state symbols. At the start, I had a solid. At the end, I haven't got a solid, which means you will visibly see the solid dissolve, all right? Or react and then not be there at the end. Usually there will be, there could be a solid produced as well. So you might have two solutions at the start and a solid at the end. So use the state symbols to your advantage. Um, so again, Naming the salt, just like we did at the start, hydrochloric acid. This time it's calcium oxide. Ignore the oxide part when you're naming it. So we're going to take the metal from there, which is calcium. And then because it's hydrochloric acid, it will be chloride. If I were to swap the acid for sulfuric, it would make calcium sulfate. 
If I were to swap the acid for phosphoric acid, it would make calcium phosphate. If I were to swap the metal oxide for tungsten oxide and hydrochloric acid, I'd end up with tungsten chloride. So hopefully you get an idea as to how the names of these salts actually comes about. So mm -hmm. we're going to have a look now at actually making a salt. Because you can see most of the time, right, and this is a classic example, the salt that's produced is in solution. And we need to do something to try and get the solid crystals out because, you know, we use a lot of salts and things like fertilizers and, um, and a lot of agriculture, actually. Uh, and we're going to look today at making cal uh, copper sulfate. So this is my reaction. I'm going to take some sulfuric acid. I'm going to add copper oxide. It's going to make copper sulfate solution and water. And here's the question. How could the solid copper sulfate be separated from the water? So how will I get solid copper sulfate crystals back? So this is a required practical, actually. So I'm just going to demonstrate it to you. All right. So to do this, because I am making copper sulfate, I'm going to need copper oxide and sulfuric acid. That's pretty much it. So hopefully you guys can see everything that I'm going to try and do here. I'm going to bring in my tripod and drawers. And this is what's part of the, and this is the exam question I want you to have a go at this week. So I think you're asked to make magnesium sulfate from a metal oxide and an acid. Well, if you're making sulfate, you'd use sulfuric acid. And because you're making magnesium sulfate, you would need magnesium oxide. We're going to use copper oxide and sulfuric acid to make copper sulfate. So first things first, we're in the to get this reaction actually going a little bit faster, I'm going to heat the acid. All right, so I'm going to heat the acid until it's just about boiling. It tells me to do that. So I'm just simply going to put a beaker there, 40 centimeters cubed of sulfuric acid. And let's get that cooking. And we're going to heat that until it's just boiling. Just boiling, not totally boiling. Boiling acids can be very, very dangerous, particularly if you let them boil dry. So, just a put it on there. Put it on our drawer on flame. And then keep that going until the acid just starts to bubble. So now I'm going to heat the acid until it's almost boiling, then I'm going to turn the button off. And then here comes the next bit. Remove the glass lid from the tripod and use a spatula. Add a small amount of copper oxide powder to the hot acid and stir with a glass rod. So what I'm going to do is, all right, I am going to add copper oxide bit by bit to the hot acid, okay? Uh, and then I'm going to add a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. I'm going to keep going until no more of this will react. So there's a special phrase that we like to use for that. So I'm going to keep adding until the copper oxide is, so some of it will remain, and that means in excess, okay? So again, I'm just getting a bit of simmering. Yeah. What I'll do is I'll give it a stir as well to make sure we've got uniform heat distribution. So I'm going to keep adding the copper oxide bit by bit and then keeping stirring. You'll see in the six mark question I've given you, you have to outline the procedure. You actually get marks for saying things like stir. Just keep adding the copper oxide and stirring it, or magnesium oxide in your case, until no more will react. So there'll be some left over. Right. So that's just coming to the boil nicely. Not far now. So this is a really hot acid. And like I say, with sulfuric acid in particular, you do not want to boil this. Uh, and especially you don't want to boil it dry. Because if you were to boil sulfuric acid dry, you'd end up with hydrogen sulfate, solid, which is just a white powder. And if you continue to heat that, that'll break down and form things like sulfur dioxide, 
and sulfur trioxide, both of which, which are toxic choking gases. Um, similar principle to all what they'll do is they'll dissolve in your lung mu mucus uh, and form sulfuric acid in your lungs, and your lungs are not designed to have acid in them, so it can cause all kinds of respiratory issues. The same principle to um, what happens when you peel an onion. So when you peel an onion, you start to get sore eyes, or when you chop an onion, and that's because some of the sulfates actually dissolve in your tear ducts to make sulfuric acid. Which is why if you peel, if you peel an onion underwater, then those gases can't escape, they just stay in the, uh, in the water around. Okay, that looks like it's, I'm just getting my first bubbles there, so I'm gonna turn off my Bunsen burner. Okay, and then I should bring it down, but I'm going to keep it on top so I can show you exactly what happens. Right, so I'm just going to add a little bit of copper oxide. Yep, and you give it a quick stir. <coughs> okay, then add a little bit more. It's probably a bit way too much. Now stir it. And you just keep adding it until there's no more, that no more will dissolve. So you can see that it's just about, now I reckon I can get some more to dissolve in that. You'll notice the color has changed as well. And there's no more black solid in it. So that means that it can take some more. I'm just gonna keep adding the black powder until there'll be no more, so. Put that in. Yeah. And then what I'll do, you keep going that, and as I speed things up, I'm just going to a big lug of it now in. So I'm pretty sure that that will not all react. So it should just stay black, effectively. So I'm just going to keep stirring. So it's not going back to that lovely transparent blue colour. You know, a little bit. It's actually, oh, actually, it might be. I'll tell you what, these are going to be some great crystals. Okay. Just checking. There is a little bit at the bottom. So again, just to show you what excess can look like as well, that should be more than enough. Okay. You can see that no more of the black powder is dissolving, it's just being stirred around. And then if I leave it, it will settle, okay? So what I've got here is I've got some copper sulfate solution. So going back to our equation, I've got some copper sulfate solution, wrong one, let's get this one. So the copper sulfate is the solution, so it should be that lovely blue uh, liquid effectively. And then I've got some of this stuff in excess. So obviously before, if all I want to get is that, if all I want is copper sulfate, I've got to get rid of the excess. So that solid that hasn't reacted, I have to get rid of. So this leads us on to phase two, okay? So, touch. what I'm going to do is I'm going to filter it, okay? So I'm just going to put this on here so you can see it. I'm going to filter that mixture there. So I'm going to fold my filter paper. Again, you can fold this into quarters, or you can do it the A-level way. So we'll keep going. Just fold it into eighths, and then fold it back on itself. Like so, and the other wing, like so. And then when you open it, it should just be like a coffee filter, like so. Okay, so I'm going to put that in there. And then carefully, this is cool enough to touch now, I'm going to pour this through. And then hopefully all the black powder in here, the copper oxide that hasn't reacted, will get caught by the filter paper.
Yeah, perfect. So you can see all I'm getting through is a lovely blue liquid. And the more copper oxide you've got to dissolve, the bluer the solution will be because it's the copper ion, thinking back to what our work on transition metals, transition metal compounds tend to be colored. So why is that a blue solution? Well, it's nothing to do with the sulfate ion, because that's what contains sulfur and oxygen. It's the copper ion, which is giving it that gorgeous blue color, okay? So there you go. And now we're gonna think about, right, so I've got my copper sulfate solution, I need to get the solid copper sulfate out. And a couple of ways we can do this, all right? The actual AQA method is to, so we're gonna filter it, there's our filtrate. Uh, the excess copper oxide is gonna be caught in there. I'll show you that when it's finished filtering. And you can heat it on a beaker of boiling water. So effectively, what's gonna happen here is you're heating up some water, that will evaporate and become steam. The steam will rise up and cause any water in there to evaporate. And you're gonna heat it until the crystallization point. So heat it until crystallization. That's when the first crystal appears. So just heat it until you first see a crystal. So again, I'll, tr I'll try and demonstrate that. Now to speed things up, because that does take a long time, heating water and then using steam to evaporate more water is a very time consuming process. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna heat it in a crystallizing basin, right? So I'm gonna take that off, replace my gauze with a clay triangle. So a clay triangle is named thus. Okay, now take my lovely deep blue solution, All right, that looks really, really blue actually, which is a good sign. I'm gonna pour it into here. So it's about two thirds full, which is just about right. So it's about two thirds full. Then I can start heating it. Make sure I'm on safety flame first. And then I'll turn it to a roaring flame. Okay, and here's where you gotta be really, really careful because this thing is gonna start boiling, but you don't want it to bubble over. So you don't want it to be a vicious boil. Um, I could put some anti-bumping granules in there, but again, that's gonna contaminate the mixture. I want it to be pure copper sulfate crystals that I'm getting here. So what good practice will be is that when it starts to boil, if you close the air hole, so it's half open, half closed, you'll get a sort of semi-roaring flame and that will give you a nice steady boil. Okay. So. There's a bit of vapor being given off now, which is good. It says. So once that starts to boil, I don't want you to really think of it, um, I don't want it to boil over. All right? I don't want it to just like uh, spray everywhere um, because I want to get as many crystals as possible. And I'm going to evaporate all this water until I just see my first crystal. And then I'll just show you the final few steps, okay? Uh, so leave the crystallizing dish in a cool place for at least 24 hours, remove the crystals from the concentrate solution. Uh, and gently pat them between two pieces of paper. So, just starting to boil. So I want a nice steady boil, okay? So, yeah, that is a, is that a nice steady boil, would you say? Yeah. So I'm just gonna keep heating that. Let's get, evaporate most of it, all right? Uh, when crystals start to form, stop heating the bath, we, uh, stop heating the water bath, or stop heating the dish in this particular case. We call it the crystallization point. Then I'm gonna leave it 24 hours, big crystals will start to form, and then I'm gonna dry it between two pieces of filter paper. So, again, I've got that on a nice, steady, roaring flame. Okay, beautiful. And that's pretty much it. So again, there's a few key things you need to be aware of when describing this method. In that six mark question that I've set you, you don't have to write in this much detail. 
there are a few key points, all right, I would like you to sort of make. So the first key point is to obviously make sure you're choosing the correct, so I'll write these on here actually. So I'm not getting any solid forms, not maybe. Nice steady boil. So first point, choose correct acid and metal oxide. So that will usually be in the question. Shoot. So if you're trying to make, I don't know, uh, aluminium chloride, for example, you'd use hydrochloric acid and aluminium oxide. So that's the first thing. So, okay, heat, acid, three, add the metal oxide. Oh, by the way, I'm not just abandoning my um, chemistry experiment here. I've got a, a lab assistant who's helping me. Do you think that's about right? There's a few crystals there, yeah. A few crystals, you can see them? Mm -hmm. So what I'm gonna do is, yeah, perfect. So apparently we've got a few crystals. So I've just seen the first few crystals. I'm gonna leave that to cool now and I'll put it in uh, by window for 24 hours and then I'll come back tomorrow and there'll be some really big ones. So add metal oxide until in excess. Okay. Key thing as well is in between that step, stir. Stir is a crucial one, okay? Next key step, what did I do then? All right, once I've got the excess oxide, I think I did this thing then, didn't I? I filtered it, so filter excess metal oxide. And again, specify which metal oxide you're using, all right? So in your question, you're trying to make magnesium sulfate. So think about what metal oxide you're gonna use. So filter the excess metal oxide, then I, uh, Evaporates. In fact, let's use the word evaporate. Let's heat the salt solution. Till crystallization. Point which is what we've just done there. So I've heated it uh, to the crystallization point, and then we're going to leave to cool and crystallize And I think the final step, which we'll do, which I'll, um, I'll record and then I'll share with you in the classroom, is to pat it dry with towels. Dry with paper towels. Okay. So you see, the actual method in the required practical went over about three pages, but these are the key points, aren't they? Like what I just done, did I do, if I could, would that enable me to have uh, uh, valid results? Yeah, as long as I'm choosing the correct acid and metal oxide. So if I'm trying to make, I don't know, rubidium phosphate, I would use rubidium oxide and phosphoric acid. All right, so you get the idea. So again, you've got this lovely deep blue solution that's left. Uh, and if I look carefully, yeah, I can see my first nice crystal forming at the bottom, all right? And what that does is, um, it act, that will act as a nucleation site. So what happens is you've got all these, so crystallization point is the point at where it just about becomes a solid. So once you get your first solid crystal formed, the rest of the particles can latch onto it, right? And then end up forming a bigger crystal. Okay, so uh, it looks like we might actually get a really decent one there. Okay, and that's pretty much it. I think you've got enough information there to try that eight mark question that I've set you. Are there any questions before I end this lesson? If so, type them into the classroom now.